Ladies and gentlemen, sometime in the next 30 minutes, your telephone may ring. If you pick it up and say these words, lots of snickers on fractured flickers, whoever is calling will think you're out of your mind. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Hans Conrad. The program is Fractured Flickers, and the time is... Well, I can't be expected to know everything, can I? As you know, each week our program takes a rather offbeat look at the early days of motion pictures and pokes a, a little good-natured fun at some of the plots and performances of silent movies. Of course, from our vantage point of 40 years later, we can easily see how trite and threadbare some of the situations were and how unbelievably bad some of the acting was. Isn't it comforting to know that in the year 2000, someone will do the same thing for the Loretta Young show? <laughs> now, here's our first flicker. When the brilliant young inventor, Thomas Alva Frink, arrived in this country, the happy news was telegraphed across the land. But Thomas was already hard at work demonstrating his newest invention, a lounge chair for people who really like to lounge. Do that again. <laughs> uh, no thanks. Tom's lollygagging was cut short when his friend Eli Pitney informed him that the eccentric Yardbird family would sponsor his experiments. Yes, when the question was asked, how high is a Yardbird, they had said, this, this high. high. <laughs> Thomas assembled his inventor's tools while showing Pitney a new way to remove hats. It was then he spoke these immortal words. I bet I can make you jump up and down on your left foot foot. Oh, you're wrong. That's my right foot. Tom tried once more, undaunted. Oh, wrong foot again. So the brilliant Pitney told Tom the difference between right and left. Out, right, slouch wise, left, up, around, two for the money and get out of here. <laughs> Arriving at the Yardbird Mansion, Thomas Alva Frink immediately set about preparing his laboratory. First, a clean wash down fore and aft. <laughs> then Thomas began to repair the damage left by the inventor who was here before him, Alexander Graham Cornplaster, inventor of the bunion. The Yardbird butler had mixed emotions about Tom's presence. Get out! Get out! Go! Leave! Would you rather I'd make you jump up and down on your left foot? <laughs> Oh, you're a sicky and I hate you, you peasant you. <laughs> but rejection was nothing new to Thomas Alva Frink, boy inventor. Many times before, he had seen his entire world collapse around him. Yet in that moment of crisis, a moment that might have quelled a lesser heart, Thomas Alva Frink got the inspiration for his greatest invention. He immediately sent up an Indian smoke signal to the anxious Yardbird family, a message that said, Help! <laughs> now Tom had seen the vision. He could sense the power in his hands as he drove himself on and on. These were no longer mere pipe dreams. In his humble and messy way, he was about to demonstrate that even a complete goof can succeed in this fabulous land. Yes, it was in the year 1899, marked down from 1900, that Thomas Alva Frink's greatest invention was born. The world's first 
combination fireplace and shower bath to keep people both warm and clean at the same time. <laughs> and as the grateful yardbirds lathered up, from the basement below came the victorious cry. And I can also make you jump up and down on your left foot. <laughs> Do your feet require a special fit? Here at Better Built Shoe Stores, we guarantee to solve any shoe problem. <laughs> Almost. Our next flicker is what the French so wittily call uh, l'opera de cheval, or uh, a horse opera. Like all other producers of westerns, we too have stolen our hero from one picture, our villain from another, our plot from a third, and so forth. But unlike other producers, we give credit where credit is due. So now, Fractured Flickers presents Apache Shane's High Noon Stagecoach to Virginia City via Alamo, Oklahoma. Who says there's no honor among thieves? <laughs> In the days of the early West, there was no more dashing figure than the legendary Jesse James. Unfortunately, this picture isn't about Jesse James. It's about the giddy -ap kid, so-called because he always had trouble stopping his horse. Whoa, whoa, boy! Why don't you roll when I say whoa? When he was able to stop, he got off and robbed the first thing he saw. Now, robbing a stage wasn't always as easy as you might think. It called for great daring and cool judgment. To leap out in front of the horses and stop the heavy coach required nerves of steel and split-second timing. The giddy -ap kid didn't have either. But he could run like a deer. The rest was easy, especially since, instead of a gun, he carried a small cannon. Another rest up. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the nearby city of Flegel Flats, the 1210 from Yuma was arriving right on time. The only passenger aboard was a stranger named Sham Otanta, the fabulously wealthy owner of a string of used horse corrals. <laughs> Sham was headed for the town's one hotel, the Flegel Flats Hilton. It was very crowded. For one thing, the Flegel Flats Poetry Circle was holding its annual convention in the lobby. <laughs> But trouble was on its way in the shape of the kid's sweetheart, Dolly Finster. And that was a terrible shape for even trouble to be in. <laughs> Dolly subtly caught Sham's eye, and Sham, of course, knew a good used horse prospect when he saw one. Luck you came to smile on Sham, Dolly. I can uh, put you on a late model Palomino. Four speeds forward, horse air upholstery, low carrying charge. It's a real cream pop. How's about it? Dolly was a live one. She really wanted that Palomino. But how much of a trade could she get for her old one? <laughs> Meanwhile, Giddy had finished counting his loot. A buck and a half. I'm rich. <laughs> but it looked as if the kid might not be rich for long. Of course, she wavered for a little while. After all, with the sales tax, it would cost $1,800. A little high for a 10-year-old horse. <laughs> but a glance at Shamotanta's honest smile reassured her. After all, it wasn't as if it were her money. <laughs> With a poker face, she turned to Sham. Were you throwing a subscription to Boy's Life? <laughs> well, uh, that seems a little, uh, shall I say, why not? It's a deal. <laughs> Just then, the giddy app kid came down to the soda fountain to celebrate his newfound wealth and ordered a round of celery tonic for the house. Here's to you. Bottoms up. <laughs> then the kid's eye fell on Sham and Dolly. He tried hard to think where he'd seen her before. And then he remembered she was his fiancée. Hold me back, boys. But nobody would. He had to go. <laughs> Honey. Dolly. You. Dolly. Finster. <laughs> oh, giddy, honey. I just bought a keen, brand new used horse, and it's only had one owner, a little old jockey in Pasadena. And it's only $1,800. Oh, you're sweet, sweet. I don't sell horses, Dolly. I sell Goodwill. That did it. Giddy was giddy with rage. <laughs> now, come on, Dolly. You and me's gonna tangle. Not me. Last time we tangled, I was black and blue for a week. All right, I'll take off my spurs. <laughs> Hit it, Xavier.
Dolly's only salvation was Shamo Tanta, who was on the sidelines playing it cool. <laughs> Sham! You called? Sham, baby, won't you please take me home? Sham escorted her outside, gave her his overcoat, and assured her everything would turn out for the worst. Back at the milk bar, Giddy was still looking for a dancing partner. He even offered to share his celery tonic. That got him a partner fast. Unfortunately, they had a difference of opinion about who was going to lead. The argument attracted the attention of everyone, including Dolly and Sham, who had decided not to go home after all. I got a hand at the Flagle Flats, Dolly. It's a swinging town. Well, it's a little quiet now, but it picks up on Saturday night. Best dance I ever saw. And is your friend popular? Look at that stag line. Yeah, everybody wants to dance with Giddy. Must be the bear grease on his hair. Floor seems to might crowd it, though. Sure, the winning couple gets a transistor radio. Well, with stakes like that, Sham couldn't resist and quickly fought his way through the stag line to partner up with Giddy. Unfortunately for him, Giddy chose that moment to sit one out. <laughs> hold it, hold it, knock it off, you guys. I haven't got a partner. Already Giddy had forgotten who Sham Tanta was. Grab your partner and hit him in the nose, bash him in the head, and stomp his toes, crunch his ribs, and mash his legs. We're gonna have some scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs! Hit him with the left, punch him with the right, take out your teeth and give him a bite. Pop him in the eye with a dozy -do dough, and maybe you'll win a radio. Radio! Hold it, hold it! We win! Sham was right, of course, but there were a few who disagreed including the other dancers, the crowd, and the orchestra leader who had fallen asleep. <laughs> and the floor was soon cleared. Wait for the next dance, folks. We're giving away a bag of salt water taffy. <laughs> Giddy, you've got a pair of magic feet. You ever study with Arthur Murray? Pavlova? Majinsky? George Murphy? <laughs> you look pooped. I'll pick up the radio. Giddy was tired, all right. But after all, to dance is to live. <laughs> And besides, a sack of saltwater taffy. <laughs> but using all his persuasive powers, Sham not only talked him into riding home, but sold him back his own horse to do it. Now, this one's a real cream puff, giddy boy. You just settle back on that log of hide upholstery and uh, hang it around the block once, huh? <laughs> <laughs> It was a changed giddy -ap kid who visited Sham the following day. His face was washed, his hair was combed, even his pants were combed. <laughs> I'd like to tour the country as your dancing partner, Giddy, but I just can't leave the used horse lot. Besides, I'm gonna marry Dolly Finster. Dolly? Dolly Finster? Yeah. Never heard of her. Who is she? <laughs> May come to you later. And so they parted, good friends. And each went away with something fine. Sham got the girl and the radio, and Giddy, uh... Well, what did Giddy get? <laughs> you know, I got a keen answer for that. But I forgot what it is. <laughs> One of the really thrilling phenomena of show business is that personality who leaps into prominence overnight and takes the entertainment world by storm as well as by surprise. Mm. Our guest this evening is just such a personality. I would say so. Formerly, formerly an excellent writer and producer, he zoomed to success as a, <laughs> as a recording star and now does nightclub, television and concert work as well. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alan Sherman, the modern menacing. Oh, no, 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 I don't sing about Minnie. I sing about Sarah, Shirley, Zelda. I never sang anything about Minnie. Well, she's nice, too. Oh, well, but but I, I didn't mean to offend you, Al. And you do sing funny parodies to folk songs and other melodies, don't you? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Uh, that's why I was wondering why you wanted me on Fractured Flickers. This isn't a musical show. Well, actually, Alan, you may not believe this, but I've written a couple of songs. Oh! Yeah, <laughs> Everybody's written a couple of songs that they're sure I could use. Other people want you to sing their song? Well, yeah, everybody wants me to sing their songs, and then I got to do it. 
Everybody wants me to sing his songs. I think that they have, well, we are trying to maintain a high standard of, of grammatical excellence. Everybody wants me to sing his, his songs. Song. Whose song? Every. <laughs> Those people. Oh, uh, all right. Everybody wants me to sing his songs. Uh, 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 uh. And then they insist that I got to do it. No, you have to do it. I got to do it. That's right. <laughs> That's even worse. I was in somebody's house the other day, uh -huh. and he brings out this song and he's insisted that I got to do it. So I said, I don't want to do it. And he said, you got to do it if you want to get out of here alive. You sang it. I'm here. <laughs> well, I'm sure you like these songs. You know, my wife thought they're very funny. Mm. You know, Hans, yeah. I attribute my success to a great principle. If one's wife likes it, throw it away. <laughs> Material rather than the wife. Oh, won't you even look at them? Why should I? Because if you don't, you'll never get out of this room alive. <laughs> oh. Hey, Hans, why don't I sing a couple of your songs? Oh, boy! Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right, Professor. Uh, let me hear a G, please. Excellent. Now, let's sing it in E flat. <laughs> this song is called Give My Regards to Fay Ray. Oh, I know. I <laughs> Give my regards to Fay Ray. Remember me to Rin Tin Tin. <laughs> Tell all the gang at Fox and Vitagraph that Flickers are back in. Tell them of how I'm yearning to hold my breath for Harold Lloyd. Give my regards to old Fay Ray and salutations, William Boyd. That's good. Now, the next one is uh -huh. called... Uh, no, it's this one here. Oh, that one. It's, uh, it's called An Agent's Lullaby. Provocative, isn't it? Yes. This is going to put all you agents to sleep. When agents' eyes are smiling, sure the deal you've made is bad. When you see an agent smiling, by his client, you've been had. <laughs> to hear his fiendish laughter as he puts away his pen. Oh, you'd give the world if you had read that contract once again. What, what do you honestly think of them, Alan? Don't you think they, they've got a certain something? Yes, but there's a cure for it now. It's a little pill. <laughs> oh. Hans? Yes? Was that all you wanted me for? Well, I guess so. Could I go now? I guess so. Safely? Of course. <laughs> well, then, good night, Alan Sherman. Good night, Hans. Very, very nice to be here. Thank you. Oh, Alan, Alan. Oh, dear. He, he forgot his music. <laughs> An attorney has just telephoned to ask how he should describe Fractured Flickers for purpose of legal action. Well, now, uh, Fractured Flickers is a film variety show. Well, not so much a, a variety as a pastiche, uh, it's a potpourri, a, a melange. Now, actually, it's a mess. <laughs> and tonight's mess ends with a particularly arid stretch in the vast wasteland of TV called From Rags to Twitchers, a Hollywood story. It could only happen in Hollywood. Glamorous, glittering Hollywood, entertainment capital of the world. Mecca for thousands of eager young hopefuls, yearning for fame and fortune. The chance to become the stars of tomorrow. A new Lola Lane. A second, Toby Wing. Another, Vera Ruba Ralston. In this mansion in Lompoc lives such a hopeful, Edna May Third, girl slave. Edna May's life used to be one of untold drudgery, carrying heavy loads, Eesh. climbing stairs, Eesh. 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 emptying slops, <laughs> scrubbing sidewalks, Eesh. Eesh. Even heaving coal. And I'm waiting for no pay. <laughs> but Edna May had her dreams, her plans. She also had a vapid face and a complete lack of acting talent. <laughs> but she studied hard, cheated on the grocery money, and one day... I'm ready! 
Daddy! <laughs> Next morning, she was on a westbound train, seen off only by the man from her neighborhood retail credit association. How... how sweet. Hey! Come on back, deadbeat! <laughs> Unfortunately for Edna May, she lost her comfy train seat when, at Albuquerque, her car was taken over by a band of Indians. Why not? We got reservations. <laughs> Undaunted, Edna May hitched a ride to Hollywood with a New Mexico ice man whom she promised to take with her to stardom. Less than four months later, they arrived in the glittering metropolis of Hollywood and dashed to the studios. They looked different somehow. Like empty. <laughs> From a friendly old studio gatekeeper named Zanuck, Ella learned the terrible truth. Oh, nobody makes movies in Hollywood anymore. It's one big ghost town. But where are all the Hollywood movies made? Overseas. Nothing being made here but television commercials. Television commercials? But I can't do a thing like that. They pay money. Money? Oh, all right. I will. Uh, figures. I'll tell everybody back home I'm working on a live bait bar. <laughs> Next morning, Edna May dashed to the sleazy one-room studio of Flea Bite Films, makers of cheap television commercials. Oh, hi. One look at Edna May's face was enough. Wow-wee! Mrs. Housewife herself! Wild! You're hired. Yes, Edna May's lack of looks and talent made her an ideal choice for TV commercials. <laughs> On the first day, she modeled low-fashion dresses. <laughs> On the second day, she modeled high-fashion hats. <laughs> Then a commercial for gas rangers. Now keep calm, hon. But George, you've invited 37 people to dinner. 38. But what'll we cook for that, Benny? Lucky we got a money buck range with a big boy oven. Get in, hon. <laughs> Inferno Fire Insurance, take three. Let's have the flames. Yes, Inferno is the only company that gives you an asbestos policy. <laughs> yes, for the next five years, Edna May appeared nationwide in hundreds of cheap commercials. Get Bloopies, the only baby soap with bleach. <laughs> Ladies, why don't you try the Little Daisy Home Roller Gym for those flabby shoulder blades? <laughs> Improve your reading habits. With Easy View's new eye training system, you will be able to read everything in sight at the same time. Even things that are behind you. <laughs> Slippery floors? It grips some floor wax. <laughs> Sweetheart. <laughs> Darling. Say, are you using mulch to drip dry deodorant? Why, uh, no. Sheesh. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. That's good. Print it. Only terrific, sweetie. Right, JB? And to this day, she remains the queen of the cheap commercials. Her life is one of untold drudgery. Carrying heavy loads. <laughs> climbing stairs. <laughs> Emptying slops. Oh, why doesn't Edna May quit? What? And leave show business? <laughs> <laughs> this debonair man of the world knows the value of a good personal appearance and how important it is to have well-groomed hair right up to the eyebrows. Does he or doesn't he? With Ajax hair pieces, only his hairdresser knows for sure. Remember, automobile safety belts may help you to live longer. Try to eat one every day. <laughs> hey, two.
Thomas Conrad saying good night for fractured flickers and leaving you with this last thought. The Galapagos tortoise has a life expectancy of 150 years. That's three years more than what's my life. <laughs>